Okay, so welcome everyone. I just started the recording. Um, today's speaker is Rizaf Chan, and oh, sorry for pronouncing your name wrongly, but anyway, um, we will talk about the second part of our nice uh, series on local bimodules, classical theory, some combinatorics of reflection and coxeter groups. So the video is recorded, it should be online this evening, and the slides should also be basically online this evening. If you have any questions, just unmute yourself, okay? Otherwise, I would recommend to stay muted uh, otherwise. Okay, so you can, you can start. Okay, uh, hello, I'm Riz Ajan, and I'll be talking about reflection groups and their relation to Coxeter groups. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and just interrupt me because I won't be able to follow the chat. Um, so let's start. We will start by defining what a reflection group is. Uh, to do that, let's start with let's first start with our setting. So we will be working with a finite dimensional R vector space equipped with an inner product. So an inner product is a symmetric positive definite bilinear form on the vector space. Um, you can think of the standard Euclidean space Rn, for instance. Uh, and the reflection of V is an orthogonal transformation whose fixed subspace is a hyperplane. So it's co-dimension one. And it's called the reflecting hyperplane. Um, if you just work out the uh, details and you'll, you'll see that for a vector that's normal to the hyperplane uh, and is of, uh, is of length one, it turns out to be this formula for, for a reflection. Any reflection can be written like this for a norm one vector normal to the hyperplane. Um, anyways, and then we will define what an affine reflection is. Um, and affine reflection is an affine transformation, first of all. Uh, what an affine tra transformation is, is a linear transformation composed with a tra translation, basically. Uh, so you can think of like forgetting about the origin, basically. Um, so these affine transformations form a group under composition, um, thanks to the fact linear transformations just don't do anything to translations, they are linear. Um, so we will call this group FV, we will denote it by FV. Um, and then an affine reflection will be a reflection conjugated by a translation. Um, and again, if you write it out in the previous formula for uh, a reflection and use the bilinearity of the inner product, you get something like this for lambda, a real number. Um, so any defi defined reflection can be written like this for n a vector that's, that has norm one, that's, that's the blank one. Um, so it's, it actually turns out to be the reflection with respect to the hyperplane, that is orthogonal complement of n, shifted by gamma in the direction of n. Uh, anyways, um, now knowing this, we can define what an affine reflection group is. An affine reflection group is a subgroup of F, uh, affine, uh, affine transformations of V. Um, and if it's, it's called the uh, affine reflection group, if it's generated by affine reflections and it's proper. Um, proper meaning for two compact sets, uh, the set of W in W such that um, for a complex set K and L, set of W in W such that K intersected with WL is not empty, is finite. So for finitely many of the elements, they intersect. Um, and this, this is like the, really the crucial property here. We will keep using it for all of our lemmas and all of our proofs. Um, and the first lemma we start with is that every orbit of W is a discrete subset of V with its natural topology. Um, I won't go into the details of the proof, but I want to give the idea. The idea is just the following. Um, since this is a metric space, actually a norm space, you can pick a compact set around the point and then uh, look at the image of the compact set uh, with respect to all of the elements of W. And then only finitely many of them will intersect themselves. And then you can find the open set inside that compact set. So only finitely many of these open sets are now intersecting. And then since there are finitely many, you can just shrink them and make it so that none of them are intersecting. So it will be a covering of the orbits uh, and it will be, therefore it will be discrete. And this is like a 
direct consequence of the probability. Um, I will now give a few, of, a few examples of affine reflection groups. I won't go into the detail of why they satisfy properness because the way I could, I, I was able to actually, uh, prove that they were actually, like they actually satisfied properness was by using some later machinery developed at, at the end of the talk. But if anyone is interested after I'm finished with it, because it won't take like one hour and 45 minutes, you can just return back and do it after we develop the machinery needed. At least the way I, I was able to do it. I had a bit of, tr bit of a trouble. Um, anyways, so the first example is just the reflections of the line at integral points. And I want to spend a bit of time in this example because um, I will now prove that this group is actually a group we've seen before. It's, it's, it's quite familiar to us. And the proof we, we do contains all the key ideas for later lemmas. So I want to spend some time. Uh, anyways, uh, Mike, let's label this, this point here, you see, with zero, and then this one with one, okay? So we, by labeling this zero and this one with one, we actually pick the orientation for the line. This is the point positive direction. To the right is the positive direction. And if you'll notice that any orthogonal transformation has to preserve the lengths, right? So if you know what an orthogonal transformation does to the orientation and what it does to the point zero, we basically know what it does to any point. We, we, know, we, know, the, uh, we know that what that orthogonal transformation is basically. Um, because just, you can just uh, look at the distance to zero and then give, you know, knowing the orientation, you'll, you'll know which way to go and basically you'll know it. So um, using this fact, we will prove that, uh, okay, let's first, I will let SI denote the reflection at I. And then I, my claim is that S0 and S1 generate the above reflection group. Uh, how we will do is the following. Uh, we will look at S1 composed with S0. And okay, let's, let's work out what, what this composition does actually. Um, okay, uh, we have to check two things, what it does to the orientation and what it does to point zero. So first orientation, if you, now to the right is the positive orientation, right? And then if you take the reflection with respect to zero, the orientation just reverses. You can just think of the reflection as like pivoting at this point and then rotating the line, uh, the rigid line, 180 degrees. So it reverses the orientation basically. Um, and then again, uh, reflecting by, re reflecting with respect to one, just reverts the orientation back to its place. So it preserves the orientation, it doesn't change it. To the right is still the positive direction. And to point zero, let's see, uh, reflecting by S0 does nothing to the point zero. And reflecting by one just takes it to two. So this is actually just the translation by two. Uh, and note that this implies its order is infinite. This is important. And uh, translations are infinite order. Um, and this will this we will encounter again in in a lemma, uh, and now uh, we will just show that these two two elements can generate any other reflection, and since the other reflections generate the group, these two will generate the whole group. So what we will do is to to get SI, we will just translate I into the lines that I, either one or zero. I mean it's either odd or it's even. So you can do that. And we have translation by two and by its inverse, we have translation by minus two. Um, and then we will do our reflection dash at whichever I lands on either one or zero, depending on the parity of I. And then we'll just translate it back to its place. So what, what, what happens there is uh, the point I will be preserved because we move it back to its place basically. And the orientation will be reversed because we just reflect once. And so this will, uh, we know what happens to orientation, we know what happens to a point, so it will just be the reflection at point SI, the point I, it will be SI. Uh, therefore, these two elements will generate the whole group. So, and notice that these two elements, they are reflections, so they have order two, so this should ring a bell. This is actually uh, the Cox group, this with the graph, this graph because it's generated by two elements of order two and their comp composition has infinite order. 
So it's the so the infantile group is a reflection group, and this is not a coincidence. Uh, we will later see that all the reflection groups are coxal groups. Uh, this is what what we are heading towards. All right, let's move on. Another example is this. Uh, this this these lines are just hyperplanes. It's a And this part particular arrangement of hyperplanes to happens to give a, a fine reflection group. Like it's it's clear that it's generated by reflection groups because we required so there are hyperplanes. Um, properness, like I said, I will I can return to it later if you'd like after developing a bit more machinery. And similar with this. Um, what I would like you to notice is that around the point, these are all the same angles. Um, and this will be a general fact, um, and here as well, we will later see. Um, moving on, I'll now give some definitions, like a lot of definitions actually, not some. Um, but those, at first they seem a bit arbitrary, but there's a like really nice geometric picture behind them, and after I give them, I finish giving them, I will explain what they mean in a picture, and I think it will be Clear. Okay, let's start. So we will denote by phi the uh, collection of uh, hyperplanes that correspond to a reflection in our group, in our affine reflection group. Okay, and given a hyperplane from that collection, we will denote the corresponding reflection by S of H, like we did in the previous example, example one of reflections of line at the integral points. Uh, choosing a vector n normal to H, we can write this v minus h as the union of these two sets. So v in the product with n is positive and negative. And what you'll notice is that if you fix this n and consider this as a function from v to r, it's a continuous function because metric of um, topology of v is basically defined by this inner product anyways. Um, so it's, it's continuous. Uh, and these are pyramids of connected components, uh, connected sets connected subsets of uh, R, not components, I'm sorry. Um, so these will be connected sets, right? And so these are connected components of V minus H and they are called the half space defined by H. It basically H just divides V into two, two, two parts. And if um, two vectors belong to the same half space, they will be said to belong to the same, same side Otherwise, they will be on the opposite sides and they will be separated by H. Uh, this is just the terminology we will use. I think it's pretty clear. Um, okay, we're moving on with definitions. And this will allow us to define an equivalence relation on V actually, uh, given a, a collection of hyperplanes as follows. Um, we will say two vectors are equivalent if for every hyperplane, they're either on the hyperplane or they're on the same side. Um, and this, uh, the equivalence classes of this relation will be called facets. In a moment, I will see, I will show you what facets look like. And then for a facet, we will define an affine subspace related to it called sport. It's basically defined by just intersecting all the hyperplanes that's, that contains F, a facet. And uh, since all hyperplanes are affine subspaces, their intersections will be an affine subspace. And this will be called, called support of f. Uh, and we will define the dimension of f by just the dimension of its support. All right. Uh, I know uh, there's, there's a lot of definitions, but yeah, in a few slides, we are getting to the picture. Um, the properness of w after a small amount of work is similar to the showing how the orbit was discrete, it implies that the set V minus all of the hyperplanes is open. Um, and then uh, we will let script A denote the component, connect components of V minus all of the hyperplanes. We'll just get rid of the lines dividing it. Um, and we will say, the, we will denote by script A the connect components of this set. And then we will denote by script A bar the closures of these connect components. And they will be called alcos and closed alcos, respectively. Um, and for an alco, we will 
define something called a face. A face of an alcohol is just a facet contained in closure of A, whose port is at the hyperplane. So it has to be co-dimension one, basically. Uh, and the ball of A uh, is a hyperplane that is the support, uh, sorry for the typo, uh, that is the support of a face of A. And note that uh, all the closed alcohols actually give you V back. Why? Because if you remember, um, alcohols uh, are defined by the inner product. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the first equivalence relation, oops, a hyperplane splits the, uh, the vector space to two, right? Using the inner product. And it was like bigger than zero or smaller than zero. And you, using vectors uh, who are who, whose inner product with respect to a fixed vector is positive or negative, you can ac actually approach those that are zero. Uh, uh, so that's why you can get every point on a hyperplane from uh, using the closure, basically. Uh, I, again, I will explain why this happens in a picture as well. Okay, finally, we have the picture. Uh, so let's say we have R2 and we have these two hyperplanes. Um, let's start by seeing what the facets are here. Okay, um, this colored regions without lines are actually facets. Why? Because let's take A0 here, the other will, others will be like symmetric arguments. Um, with respect to h bar, points here are in, on the same side, and with respect to h, they are also in the same side. So this a zero is a facet, basically. And then there is this line segment here, uh, belonging to h bar, to the right of the origin and to the up of the origin, not including origin, uh, which is important, pretty important. This is also a facet. Why? Because with respect to h prime, they are on h prime. So and with respect to h, they are on the same side, right? So this line segment here is a facet. And similarly, this right line segment, not including the origin, is a facet. And same for these. And origin itself is actually a facet as well. Why? Because with respect to h, it's on the h. With respect to h prime, it's on a, h prime. So there's, there's only a single point satisfying that. That's, that's the intersection point. Like that's. I've been calling it the origin because that, that doesn't really matter. But yes, yeah, it's the, it's the intersection point that's labeled by zero zero, so it's the origin. Um, uh, that's that's also a facet. So these are all the facets. And then, what are the faces of uh, these alcohols? Uh, and I mean, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see what the alcohols are now. Alcohols are actually a zero, a three, a two, and a one. Why? Because if you remove these lines, it's clear that these four are the connected components. Um, and then we will see what the faces of these alcohols are. They're actually like for, I will do it again for A0. The others are really similar. There's not, nothing interesting. Um, so let's see. What are the facets contained in this closure? It's this one, this one, and the intersection point. Those are three facets. Um, this, this thing here, um, this facet, it's contained only on H prime. So it's inter uh, all of the intersection of all of the um, hyperplanes that contain this facet is just H prime itself. Uh, so it's it's a hyperplane, it's co-dimension. Uh, so the face is co-dimension one. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a face. The facet is co-dimension one, so it's actually a face. And similarly for this, it, this time it's H. Uh, for the origin, uh, the problem with the origin is that intersection of these uh, it's, it's contained in both of the hyperplanes. So in the intersection of the hyperplanes containing it is just a point. So it's not it's not a hyperplane anymore. It's it's co-dimension two. Um, uh, by the way, uh, for this definition to work, uh, you want to call these these alcohols themselves to be dimension two. Like actually, not let's say in this example dimension two. You want them to be dimension two. So uh, we take like the convention that empty intersection is the whole space itself. Uh, so this is a dimension two facet, this is a dimension two facet, this is a dimension one facet, and this point here is the dimension zero point facet. Uh, okay, I think I think 
Uh, and uh, on the, if I don't know if I mentioned this, but I, I don't think so. I, I skipped it. I'm sorry. Um, a wall of A is just a sport of a face of A. Uh, a, a sport of a face of A is called a wall of A. So here again, let's let's, let's look at A zero. It, it's a face here. The sport of this face is H prime. So H prime is a wall of A, A zero. And similarly for for this face of A zero, H is the sport of that uh, sport of that face. So H is a wall of A zero. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't that I skipped it. Uh, anyways, I think this picture really makes uh, every every definition there really clear, and they're geometric. They're nice. Um, okay, uh, now we will move on. Um, so these alcos, we will pick one of them, and we will call it the fundamental alco. Um, it's just, just an arbitrary one. Why are we doing this? Because uh, if you remember our first example, uh, the line with reflections at the integral points, uh, think about what the alcoves there are. It's actually the intervals. And the walls of the alcove are actually just the points, the integral points. So what we did there was actually by like looking at S0 and S1, um, we picked the alcove and we looked at the reflections corresponding to the walls of that alcove. So we're trying to, um, we will try to find the Coxeter presentation for every reflection group using a similar idea here. So we just pick pick one, pick pick an arbitrary alcove and call it the fundamental alcove. Uh, and that's the motivation behind it. Um, and we will denote by the set of hyperplanes which contain walls of, uh, uh, I'll call the fundamental alcove delta from now on, uh, contain the walls of delta. Uh, we will denote it by phi delta. Uh, all right. Uh, and of course, these walls all have, since they are hyperplanes, all have uh, corresponding reflections, and we will denote the set of these refle reflections by S. And we will try to um, see that there is a Coxeter presentation, like using S as the generating set. Um, and let's define a subgroup of W. Uh, the subgroup WS is generated by elements of S. And what we will try to do is show that it's actually the whole, whole of W. And note that W actually acts naturally on the set of alcoves. Uh, why is this? Because uh, for two points to be equivalent, for two points to be uh, on the same alcove, uh, it needs to just, with respect to some set of normal vectors, like representing the hyperplanes, it, uh, that means they need to satisfy some, like, parity of, on the inner products with respect to those uh, vectors, right? And any element of W is an orthogonal transformation, so it preserves the inner product. So it, it doesn't destroy the uh, equivalence between two points. So when you act on it, like act on two points, there's still equivalence. So it takes one alcove to another alcove, basically. Um, and then we will proceed with some lemmas, basically just showing that finally showing that the uh, reflection groups, affine reflection groups are coxy groups. Um, first, WS acts transitively on uh, script A, on the alcoves. Um, it's actually, um, this is, uh, anyways, uh, let, me, let me just give you the idea and then I'll, I'll say the significance of it later for the, while explaining lemma two. Um, the idea is just picking a point in the fundamental alcove, and if there's another, uh, picking a point in any other alcove we like. And then if they're not on the same, same alcove, if they're not on both on the uh, fundamental alcove, there must be a wall of uh, the fundamental alcove separating them, right? Otherwise, they'd be in the same alcove. They, they'd both be in this fundamental alcove. Um, and notice that this implies taking the uh, re reflection of the point in the other alcove by, uh, by the reflection corresponding to the wall of the fundamental alcove, we reduce the distance because there, there used to be a, a hyperplane separating them. Now there's, there's, there's not. They, they, they were on the different sides. Now they are on the same side, basically. Uh, that's, that's, I think it will be clear. Um, so, and then the rest, uh, rest of the proof is just using properness to make sure there are finitely many candidates so that uh, at some point you will not be able to reduce the distance 
so that that will mean they're on the same alcohol. So that will mean you move the other alcohol to the fundamental alcohol, basically. And then using the inverses of these operations, you can take the fundamental alcohol to another alcohol. So you, do you want to take one alcohol to another? You just take one, get it to fundamental alcohol, and then you, from fundamental alcohol, you take it to the other one, basically. Uh, this is how you can, using all the elements of WS, because you're using um, the reflections of the laws of fundamental alcohol, that's how you get one alcohol to another alcohol. Um, all right, and uh, two is this W is actually generated by, the W is actually equal to WS. Uh, this is actually like the, exactly the same thing we did in the example, right? Um, what we did there is just, we, we have the fundamental alcohol that's the interval between zero and one, and we had um, another alcohol and using the reflections of the walls, like elements of S basically, we could get that alcohol to the fundamental alcohol and do the reflection there and then just translate it back. Just, uh, let's not use the word translate because that was specific to that, just go put it back. And you can do this, why? Because by lemma one, we, we know that it acts transitively. So you can do this, you can pick an alcohol. Okay, so how, let, let me just explain how we will get a reflection. Uh, to get an arbitrary reflection, just pick an alcohol that, um, uh, so you're, you're looking at the reflection, it has a corresponding hyperplane, and just pick an alcohol that contains that hyperplane as a wall. And um, then you'll take that alcohol, move it to fundamental alcohol, and then do your reflection there, and then put, uh, play it back. So it will, it will be the, it will end up with the, you will end up with the reflection you are looking for. Basically, that's the idea. Um, this is possible because of lemma one. And yeah, that's how you show that W is actually WS itself. Um, and for the third one, suppose the walls of the fundamental alcohol meet, intersect. Uh, if they do, then they intersect at an angle that's smaller than pi over two. And moreover, the angle is of the form pi over m for some m in natural numbers. And the idea is like for the first claim there, um, if it was greater than pi over two, you could just uh, take the reflection of, uh, of the hyperplane here. You can take the reflection uh, of one of the, uh, with respect to one of the hyperplanes and the, other, uh, the image of the other hyperplane will land in the alcove, which is a contradiction because alcoves are basically defined by just taking away all the hyperplanes. Um, and then uh, for the other part, properness will imply there will be finitely many alcoves carrying the intersection points. And you can just think of like um, use, taking a ball around this uh, intersection point, a closed ball around and just intersecting, with the, the, intersecting it with the alcoves, the closed, closed alcoves. So you will get a compact set because this is a finite dimensional space and then just reflect it along. So uh, since they all will contain the uh, intersection point, there, there must be finitely many because they all intersect by properness. Uh, and since reflection preserve angles, uh, they will have to meet at the same angles because if they don't, you can just use the reflection. So they, let's say they share a wall uh, and they meet at different angles, then you can just take the reflection with respect to that wall, but uh, reflections preserve angles, so they have to be the same angle. And if there's m alcoves in one side of a hyperplane, you can just take reflection, so there will be m alcoves on the other side, so there will, there will not be an even number of alcoves, two m alcoves, and uh, so the angle will be just two pi over two m, which is pi over m for some m. And uh, we are really close, so now we will define a matrix, which, which is the Coxeter matrix actually, um, for H and H prime, the balls of a fundamental alcohol, uh, we will let S and T denote their corresponding reflections and define MST as if they meet, we will define it as M, where pi over M is the angle they meet. And if they do not meet, we'll just say it's infinity. Um, you can just think of, think of it like since they are parallel, they meet at infinity. Um, and composition of reflections of two parallel hyperplanes is translation actually. Uh, we've actually seen like again, in the example one, the um, line, line 
reflect that integral, integral points. We've seen an example of that. You can just think of uh, extending that picture to R2 by drawing vertical lines at uh, in, integral points and then just thinking of the reflections, they are all parallel. So we see that the S2 and S plus one com composed was just a translation and it's the same idea really. You can, you can, you can just work it out. It's not, I think it's intuitively clear and it's not hard to work out. Um, and meanwhile, the composition of reflections of two hyperplanes meeting at an angle P pi over m is the rotation of degree two pi over m. And therefore, it has order m. Uh, to see this, you can think of, uh, okay, all right. They have this intersecting point, right? And uh, orthogonal transform transformation preserve lengths, the distances. So uh, any point here will have to, since this intersection point doesn't, if you reflect along these two, um, the intersection point doesn't move, so it, that point will have to move on a circle, so it will correspond to the rotation, basically. And to see the angle, just uh, I'll just show it on the picture for R2, but it's a similar idea. Pick a point, uh, it will go to another alcove, and then um, if you reflect again, it will move two alcoves apart from the original, its original alcove. So it will be, since each alcove is, it meets at pi over m angles, it will move to a two pi over m degrees, basically. That's the idea. Um, and actually this rotation picture is especially nice since like uh, you can think of two parallel hyperplanes as just meeting at infinity and mm, rotation with respect to infinity is just a translation. So it's, it's actually coherent, it's nice. Um, so again, uh, and you'll notice that this is actually, this, this will, um, if there are like finitely many walls, which is the case, uh, this will define a symmetric matrix. Why? Because if you compose two, two it's, mm, ST, if ST correspond to a rotation of degree two pi over m at, in one direction, then TS will just be the reverse direction. So it, it will still be a rotation of degree two pi over m. Uh, just in the other direction, so it will still have order m. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, uh, you don't have, even have to think about, uh, think about that because, uh, I mean, by, by our definition, if S, if they meet, it doesn't matter which one you pick first because S and T just pick two hyperplanes and they meet at an angle, basically. Anyways, but the, the fact that their composition have to, has to have order m is important. Uh, why? Because of this theorem. Uh, and we just basically proved it. W admins the following Cox's representation. It's just the reflections in the set S. But if you remember, recall that S was the collection of reflections corresponding to the uh, reflections with respect to walls of the fundamental level. Um, so they all have order two and uh, ST has order M and it's symmetric. So it's a Cox group. Um, of course, S has to be finite. Uh, okay, ah, I'm sorry, I'm moving too fast. All right. Um, now we've seen that reflection groups are Coxeter groups, right? Uh, we will try to see what some notions from Coxeter groups look like in reflection groups. Some, uh, like for example, the expressions, reduced expressions, um, the length function, they all co correspond to really nice geometric things here. Um, all right, uh, we will start with expressions. Expressions will just correspond to st strolls. And like strolls, it's a, it's a really good name. I, I like the name because it's, it really corresponds to a walk. Um, a stroll will be a sequence uh, of alcoves such that it starts with the fundamental alcove and each consecutive alcove has to share a face. Um, uh, you can think of it like as moving through alcoves through shared faces. And I'll show you a picture in a moment, which will make it clear. Um, but uh, for now, we won't allow two consecutive al uh, alcoves to be the same. Um, there's a remark in the book which says in section three, we will redefine stroll to allow um, two alcoves, two consecutive alcoves to be the same, to be the same, but for, for this talk, we're not, we're not allowing it. Um, Again, the uh, stroll can be thought of as a path, starting from the fundamental alcove. And the length of a stroll will be the number of times it crosses a hyperplane. 
So, and we will say a stroll is reduced if um, you don't cross the same hyperplane twice. If, uh, if fi and fj are never contained in the same hyperplane. Um, you can think of like as a, 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 a reduced stroll as a like walk with a purpose. Purpose you want to get from the fundamental alcohol to another alcohol, but you don't you don't take steps that 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 you don't waste any steps. You don't go through the same hyperplane twice for no reason. You you just avoid it if you can. Uh, for example, the, this is examples of two strolls ending up at the same alcohol actually. Um, and the left one is clearly reduced because you don't ever cross the hyperplane twice, but the right one is actually not reduced because you, you, you did this, this the detour here. Um, all right. Uh, so now we know what a stroll is. Uh, we will see how it actually corresponds to the expressions. Um, we will take a okay since since uh, W is simultaneously a uh, reflection group and a coxeter group. So it's a, it has a coxeter representation. We, we've shown it. So in that coxeter representation, we can just uh, presentation or header. I think uh, I hope I'm not using the wrong terminology. Um, we, we can take an expression for a element. Um, let x underline denote an expression. And note that delta and S1 delta share a common base. Why? Because you just, S1 delta is essentially uh, reflecting the fundamental alcohol with respect to a wall, so they, they share that wall, they share that face that corresponds to S1. Um, and similarly, if two alcohols already share a face, um, using a reflection won't, won't change the fact that they, they still share a face, because they will just share the image of the face, basically. Uh, uh, so, if... Uh, I think I messed up here. But trying to write that, uh, I can fix it before putting it online. Uh, anyways, if if, thing, if two alcohols already share a face, uh, reflecting won't won't change the fact that they share a face. So, um, since delta and S two delta share a common face, S one delta and S one S two delta won't will share a face again, right? Uh, by the previous argument. So just iterating this. Process we, to any expression, we can associate a stroll like this. You just start with the fundamental alcohol, like you should, because it's in definition. And then you move to S1 lambda, and you move to S1, S2, uh, not lambda, I'm sorry, just delta, S1 delta, S1, S2 delta, and so on and so forth. Um, all right. Okay. And this is really nice that the fact that is reduced expressions are actually reduced strolls. And we will prove this. Um, we will, how, how we will show this is, um, we will just use induction on the length of a element, basically. Um, and we will actually prove something more. We will prove that length of an element is the number of hyperplanes that separate delta and x delta. Um, and notice that if we prove this fact, right, um, the only part should be should should follow immediately, or if but uh, let, let, let me see. Um, so, for a corresponding stroll to be reduced, it has to uh, cross all of these hyperplanes that uh, separate the, the, the two alcohols, and they, it has to cross them once. So it will be the length. So any expression corresponding to it has the same length. So that has to be also reduced because it's these these two things are. Uh, equal if if we prove this only if part just is is a consequence of that so so we will just prove the if part and this fact to prove the proposition um, before we, we, I move on let me give you an example if this is x lambda and, uh, x delta and this is delta um, there are six hyperplanes that separate it one is one here two three, four, five, six. All right, uh, let's denote by L prime X as this the number of hyperplanes separating uh, delta and X delta. And we will show in a moment that it's actually equal to L of X. Um, we will use induction and for 
L of X is equal to zero and one, it's, it's trivial, really. Uh, they, it, they, it just, they share a single face. Um, and so I'll just do the inductive step. Let's start with the reduced expression. Um, reduced expression X underlined. And if you, if you assume that this is reduced, this Y underline also has to be reduced. Why? If, if this is not reduced, we can find the um, shorter expression and then we can just multiply it by SK to find the shorter expression for X, which would contradict the fact that this X underline is a reduced expression. So if this is reduced, this, uh, this also has to be reduced. All right. Um, and since this has shorter length, um, by induction, L of phi is equal to L prime of phi. Um, so A underline of Y underline, uh, the corresponding stroll, uh, crosses K minus one distinct hyperplanes, because that's the number of them separating it. It's, it has length K minus one. Um, and then since X lambda is actually the X delta alpha, I'm, I'm really sorry for messing it up constantly. X delta is one step away from Y delta, um, either just taking that one step will increase um, L prime of X by one, so they will be equal, or the hyperplane separating X lambda from Y lambda has already been crossed, so it won't uh, increase L prime, basically. Um, um, if this is the case, we're done. If it's not, let's see what happens. If it's not, it has to be a picture like this. Uh, you, you, this is the H, the hyperplane separating Y delta from X delta, and it has to be crossed at some point I. What we will actually do is, we will construct another stroll that's shorter. Um, how we will do this? We will just avoid crossing this at all. Okay, so after you move from A, I'm, AI minus one to AI, there's, there's these steps here, and you can just take the reflection of these steps with respect to H, right? Um, and since there are like, if there are n steps here, there will be n reflected steps here. And since you avoid just going up there, you reduce the length of the stroll by one. So about uh, it's putting it rigorously, it's, it's, it's this, if we, if we construct a new stroll, where these steps are obtained by just reflecting. And this is an expression, this basically nets you an expression for x shorter than k, it is a contradiction because we assumed S1 to SK was a reduced expression, so that cannot be a shorter expression. So by contradiction, so we showed that L of X has to be L prime of X and we're basically done. Um, sorry for this, okay. Uh, now let's prove Matsumoto's theorem. Um, uh, it says that two reduced expressions for X may be related by braid relations. And we will do this using strolls basically. Um, again, we will do induction. This is just a sketch of the proof. I won't go into details of blah, 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 why some, some claims are true. Um, okay, uh, so let's see. Take two reduced expressions for x, x1, under, x underline one, x underline two. And if they end with the same expression, this is, uh, I'm sorry, same, uh, same element, we're done. Why? By induction, basically, because you can just consider these expressions without the last one, and uh, by induction, they are related by reduced, uh, uh, they, they are related by braid relations, and then you can just put the elements back there, so you get a braid relation relating x underline one to x underline two. Uh, and if we assume that they are different, um, consider the hyperplanes separating x delta from x cell delta, and X prime, X S, S prime L delta, respectively. So it's a picture like this. So this, um, this, these two hyperplanes actually divide the plane into four, and three of them are occupied with X delta, X S L delta, X S prime L delta. And then there will be a unique alcove, which contains their intersection point in the closure and lies on the same side as um, the fundamental alcove. Um, and let's call it y, y, y delta, all right? And we will just pick a reduced stroll from 
delta to y delta. Okay. Um, so if we pick a reduced rows, it, it gives us a reduced expression, basically, uh, because we go through each uh, separating hyperplane once. So it's the, it's, the, it's the consequence of the fact that L of x is, uh, uh, L of a length of a element is the number of hyperplanes separating delta from that element times delta, that times delta. Um, corresponds to, to a reduced expression. And then there are actually, if you notice, there are two ways of ex uh, extending this uh, reduced expression to x delta. And, and uh, the two ways are either going from the up, upper side of h prime or going from the lower side of h prime. Uh, and you basically have, you basically are constrained to the alcohols containing the um, containing the point, the intersection point in the closure. Otherwise, you're just wasting a step because if you go in, an, in, in any other direction, you'll have to come back. So that's, that won't be reduced. Uh, so you're just constrained to this. Like I, either you can take this way the, on the upper side of H prime or lower side of H prime. And this, this way is just SL because SL, if it, I mean, uh, look, we got from the fundamental alcohol to here. So the bottom of the fundamental alcohol SL is here. It corresponds to H now. So it's either SL, S prime L, SL, S prime L, or it's either, uh, or it's S prime L, um, SL, S prime L, SL. Um, and notice that since uh, these, these two hyperplanes meet, meet at the angle pi over M, right? And in one side, there are M alcohols, right? Uh, and this M was the, if you, if you recall, this M was the order of the reflection, the order of the composition of these two reflections. So it, it's a, it, it ends up with something like this. Uh, there are M elements here, beginning with S, S prime L, SL, or beginning with SL and continuing, with, uh, continuing alternating SLs and S prime Ls, basically. And this is, this is clearly just a braid relation. So W1 and W2 are related by a braid relation. Uh, a single braid relation, in fact. And this actually finishes the proof. Why? Because W1 ends with the same element as uh, X1, right? It ends with SL. Uh, so uh, by induction, this is a similar argument. Uh, we, we did it already. They have to be related by uh, braid relations. So X1 is related to W1 by braid relations. W1 is related to W2 by braid relations. And W2 is related, by, uh, is related to X2 by braid relations. So X1 is related to X2 by braid relations. Uh, that's basically it. Right, uh, so, so this is really nice, right? But um, there, are, there, seem, there are reduced trolls which don't go through Y delta. Uh, yeah, sure, but uh, you're right on that. There are reduced rows which don't go through y delta, but we will just pick one that goes through y delta because it's it's it's, it's enough to show like there's one there's there's a way of getting from x one to x two by relations, and it doesn't matter like if there are other expressions that you cannot get through, I guess. But doesn't Matsumoto's theorem, you need to take two arbitrary strolls and show that the two arbitrary strolls are related, reduced strolls are related by a braid relation? Uh, yes, you're right. But uh, um, in that case, I guess, I mean, let me think. In that case, you can just like um, take, take as x1 and x2, like those two relations, and then you can find another another alcove, like unique alcove, and then you can go through there, and then you can relate those two as well. Like you can just repeat this proof for those two. Uh, yeah, you just have to look at different uh, hyperplanes, basically. Is that fine? Okay, I think it's maybe a bit trickier, but uh, okay, sure. Why don't you continue? Okay. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Tubnauer can help you at the end of the talk. We will have time, I think. 
uh, anyways, like uh, there's not that there's not much left, anyways. Uh, at, at most, fifteen to twenty minutes. Um, okay, uh, I'm sorry for going on, going on. So, right, these reflection groups they are Coxeter groups, um, and there are some really nice geometric pictures. So we wanna see if for any Coxeter group we get a similar space where there's geometry involved. Uh, and the idea thankfully turns out to be yes, and the answer, not idea, the answer turns out to be yes, there's a, there's a space and we will construct it in a moment and it's called the Coxter complex. Uh, does there exist a similar space in a national action for an arbitrary Coxter group? Yes. Um, to construct it, uh, we, will, we will use uh, simplexes. So if you take a Coxter group of rank n, uh, we will take uh, the n minus one simplex laying in the fi n minus one space, and the fact it's uh, why it's n minus one is because n minus one simplexes have n faces, and n is the rank of the Cox group. So we'll just color each face of the simplex by uh, an element of s, uh, and then for any s, we can just reflect. Uh, the simplex along the face colored by colored, colored by it and this, this will give us a way of gluing two copies of that simplex together and this will be called an s gluing and this is an example for the case rank is three and s is red you just reflect it and just glue it all right um, so using this s gluing you will construct the coxter complex uh, you just for each element you take a copy of the simplex and you, you label it by the element. So you take a copy of delta for each w, you call it delta w. And then for all the w in big W and all the s in s, you glue w, uh, delta w to delta w s by, by, by an x gluing. And you can do this. And w x on this complex by identifying delta of x by Delta of Wx, basically. And this action is faithful. I, I won't go into detail why. And I will just instead just give you an example, construct you an example for the diagonal groups, these groups, Coxeter groups with this graph. Um, let's construct the Coxeter complex. Uh, I took the liberty of just coloring this blue and this red. Um, so if in the case of M being finite, uh, what are the elements of this group? It has to be alternating sequences of S and T because if you put S, 2S or 2T consecutively, it, it will just be the identity. And the maximum length of a reduced expression will be, uh, not reduced expression, I'm, I'm sorry, for any expression. No, no, reduced expression uh, will be M. Since if it's longer, uh, there will be a sequence of S and T of length M inside, which we can switch up using the braid relations to get rid of either 2S or 2T resulting in a lower, lowering the length of the expression. So you can just, if you have something longer than M, you just reduce it down to length M. So the maximum is M. And now just, just draw the complex because the, when rank is two, it's just one, one simplex which we can draw. Uh, let's start with the identity. And then for identity, there are two faces we will glue. Identity times S and identity times T. And then I'll keep just gluing from this side, from the S side. And then you, you for S, you glue from T. And uh, it's important that like this, this side is red because T corresponds to red, red gluing. So there's, there's one choice, basically. You, you just have to glue it to S. Um, and then you keep doing this until you get the maximum length, which is M. And then at that point, you, you notice that there is this red, uh, red face here. So we have to glue something, glue, glue the element that's the, obtained by multiplying, this from, multiplying this with T from the right. Um, but thanks to the braid relation, this T will cancel out. So we'll get something. Uh, smaller and then we have we have no choice we have to multiply it by s because it's a, it's a blue face so you just keep doing this until you come back 
So model of my bad drawing abilities, this is actually a 2M gun. Um, uh, and I'll show you in a moment just a better drawn version for M equals 3. Is this, this is a hexagon. Um, uh, for example, let's see what the action does here. Uh, for T, multiplying by T from left, you, you, you take this S to TS, right? You, so you take this face to this, uh, just what, what, what the action, action of just multiplying by T does, and this identity to T. So it's like clear that uh, multiplying by T is just a reflection here uh, from this uh, okay, corners of the rectangle I'm drawing here. Uh, and similarly for S, it's, it's this one. So uh, the action we defined actually really do correspond to some reflections here, is what I want to, want to demonstrate. Um, and let's see what, what it looks like for the case M equals infinity. And it's this. Uh, maybe this shouldn't surprise you because we've already seen an example where the line integral points was actually the infinite dihedral group. And why this happens is essentially because there's no braid relation here. There's not because it's not the finite order. So you cannot close the loop basically. It has to go on forever. Um, and this, is, this, is, this turns out not to be an accident that the previous thing was homeomorphic to S1 and this is contractible. And this is really surprising to me. I, I have no idea why it happens, but um, uh, a Coxter complex of a Coxter group W is either homeomorphic to SN if it's finite and of rank n plus one, or if it's infinite, it's contractible. And yeah, I, I have no idea why this happens, but it's, it's really nice that it happens. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, all the images I used are either from the book or I drew them. And I think you can you can see which one I drew. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions or which, which, if you would like to go back to the examples, you can. Okay, so first of all, let's take the speaker. Okay, and you can unmute yourself and clap if you want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Um, there was a question, or you can, you can clap in the chat, of course, yes. Yeah, so, so I, I think, um, so what he showed is that X underline, X1 underline is, uh, 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 no, so what you showed is that W1 and W2 are related by, by a braid relation using, using your geometric picture. Mm -hmm. And X1 is related by a braid relation to W1 by yeah. induction because they end in the same symbols, same for Y, what was it? X2 and W2. X2 and w2. Um, so maybe we can go back. Maybe go back to the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So I, I guess, okay, let me just say in case, in case you're addressing a different question. Um, my worry is that what if you just walk all the way down and then so it takes 11 steps to get from delta to x delta right mm -hmm. okay. and you can cho choose 11 steps which completely avoid y delta and you can choose 11 steps which go through y delta and if you you should be able to compare those two walks yes. right and show that captured by the induction that's a, that's a tricky part um yeah so everything that avoids y delta is captured by induction because they're short, shorter words, you can you can manipulate y delta uh, until it is where you want it to be using braid relations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you if you go from like if you take the walk you suggest, and then yeah. um, you you can you can just make make sure that y delta is actually related by like braid relations to this this walk like this this thing because it's shorter by induction without actually crossing the x lambda. Right, that's that's the inductive step. So you, you don't have to worry about that existing other walks. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. 
right? If there is any other question, I think it, I think it was a bit short, so I'll, I apologize for that. But I like I I think I covered everything I need to. I think it was very nice. Uh, so the examples were clear and everything was very nice. Thank so you. if there are no further questions, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I will turn off the recording. Mm -hmm.